Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Nikolai Petro. He is professor of political science at the University of Rhode Island and author of the new book, The Tragedy of Ukraine, What Classical Greek Tragedy Can Teach Us About Conflict Resolution. Nikolai Petro, good to have you on. Nice to be with you. Before we get into the book, let me just ask you your thoughts on the state of the Ukraine war, where we are at today and where you see this going. Well, it looks like it's going to drag on. Of course, that could be just the negotiating stance uh, uh, for all the sides involved. Um, my focus has never been on the battlefield successes and failures, but really to look and understand how this conflict came about and what is likely to uh, resolve it in the long run, to lead to what I call social harmony. Well, yes. And so this is, I think, um, what makes your book so unique is that you have, well, first of all, you have access to Ukrainian sources that otherwise we just do not read about in the uh, in the NATO states. Um, but also, you frame this conflict not so much as a international one, talking about um, all the factors that get a lot of attention, such as NATO expansion, you really focus on the internal dynamic here and how the war in Ukraine is really an outgrowth of, a, un, of an unresolved internal conflict in, inside Ukraine that's been going on for a long time now. So for people who are not familiar with this line of thinking, who are more, who have seen the arguments about NATO expansion and the US-Russia conflict, Talk to us about how you frame the internal Ukraine conflict and how that has led to this crisis of today. Well, I see the conflict as having multiple layers. In other words, there is Russian aggression and there is a battle between, as you correctly put it, uh, the NATO states and Russia over control of Ukraine. And uh, overlaying that, however, is a deep-seated and long-lasting internal conflict, which I see as a conflict over who gets the right to define what it means to be Ukrainian. And this conflict, as I point out by reference to historical sources, has been going on for at least 150 years. You can trace this debate between uh, Galician or Western Ukrainian intellectuals and Malaros or um, uh, Eastern Ukrainian and Southern Ukrainian intellectual elites. And they each have very different uh, definitions of what it means to be Ukrainian. And they haven't been able to find a way to reconcile with each other in a way that would allow a national civic identity to emerge that would unify the country. And I keep coming back to this internal debate because to me, it's the most important one. And I argue that it's the most important, more important than the uh, battles between Russia and Ukraine and the battles between the West and Russia over Ukraine, because if Ukrainians were united on their identity, there wouldn't be all these external forces who could pull them apart. They could simply say, leave us alone. We know who we are. And we you know, have made a, a decision. But as it is, uh, right now, each of these constituencies appeals to uh, external forces who are only too happy to pull the country apart. And the people suffering are average Ukrainians. And in terms of what you call Galician uh, Ukraine. That's the uh, Ukrainian identity that is based in the West, historically aligned with uh, the Banderite movement, uh, the movement of uh, Stefan Bandera, the Nazi collaborator. Talk about how they see the ethnic Russian component of, of Ukraine and how that has fueled into the, the current crisis of today. Well, historically, that is to say, uh, and the early part of the 20th century, um, it was merely a sense that 
the people in the rest of Ukraine, outside of the four westernmost regions, really had to be taught to appreciate the value of Ukrainian independence and uh, who they really were, as opposed to identifying too closely with Russia. Over time, however, the frustration of these nationalist forces who failed to obtain national independence after World War I, uh, and then again in World War II failed uh, in the ill-fated alliance that um, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists forged with, um, uh, with, with Nazi Germany, um, that resulted in increased hostility and frustration uh, with their Eastern counterparts. And as a result, uh, after, the, um, after the declaration of Ukrainian independence in 1991, the country really had to come to terms with that identity. And unfortunately, uh, rather than trying to uh, establish a framework where each region could define what it was comfortable with locally in terms of its identity, which might differ from the standards of another region, but would nevertheless uh, be defined subordinately to the priority of national unity. In other words, a form of confeder uh, a form of federation, uh, which was uh, actually advocated by uh, a number of Ukrainian politicians, including uh, Western Ukrainian uh, politicians at the time, and the, the leader of the uh, very popular Ruch movement in Western Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that was dismissed as unacceptable uh, by uh, nationalist strands, which were always very prominent in uh, the local politics of the Western regions. And uh, since, 19, since 2014, it has become, I would say, uh, the, the dominant ideological matrix for the current government, um, both Poroshenko and his successor Zelensky. Uh, that's not to say, and I'm very careful to, to say this in the book, I don't define everyone in government as a neo-Nazi or a fascist. That's not correct. But um, the far right plays an inordinate role in shaping the political boundaries of national discourse. And this uh, existed uh, before 2014, but uh, was exacerbated by Russian intervention in Ukraine after 2014. And of course, uh, now is, is more or less... Uh, the standard level of political discourse. And the problem with this, obviously, is it doesn't allow for the political participation of a huge number of Ukrainian citizens. And this is a problem for the nation going forward. What do we do with anywhere between a, no less than a quarter of the population to more than a third? How do they, how are they to be integrated into uh, a modern Ukrainian pluralistic society that has aspirations to join a modern pluralistic European Union. As you point out in the book, it's not just Russian intervention that has helped empower the far right in Ukraine since 2014. Uh, the far right played an outsized role in the coup uh, that uh, overthrew Yanukovych in 2014, which set off the Donbass war. Uh, the far right received uh, a major share of the new cabinet positions inside that government. But let me ask you to address the counter argument, which is that, well, look, if you look at the polls, if you look at election results, the far right don't fare very well. They they only have a they only get a very a a a, a, a tiny percentage of the vote in elections. So how is it then that the far right plays a influential role in Ukrainian politics if their political support is so marginal? because they define the tone of politics. They are the predominant intellectual uh, elite. Now, I don't 
mean that in the sense of having the dominant thinking, uh, but rather the dominant ideological framework and language of politics. And all you have to do is look at the statements of senior government officials, the head of the National Security and Defense uh, Council, um, Mr. Danilov, um, leading politicians in the Rada and uh, senior advisors to the president. These are all important uh, figures. And it's not only Zelensky. Some even argue, I have no way of uh, saying whether this is true or not, that Zelensky is more of a figurehead, a popular voice that uh, can appeal to Western audiences. He plays no doubt, no doubt a very important role, but he has a large staff and administration under him who embrace the harsh rhetoric of the far right very openly and unabashedly. And as I show in my book, it's not hard to trace these statements back uh, to senior officials going back uh, eight years or more. And let me ask you to discuss something you document in your book, which is the role of groups like the right sector uh, in establishing these um, institutions, uh, paramilitary organizations, battalions, uh, groups that basically act as enforcers of their agenda. What that looks like on the ground inside Ukraine and how that leads to influence for the far right over Ukrainian politics. So... The parliamentary opposition uh, refers to the Svoboda Party, which has had uh, representatives in parliament since 2012. And the extra parliamentary um, opposition refers to the right sector and people associated with Dmitry Yarosh. What I point out by um, a careful analysis of their documents and public statements is that these two groups interact with each other and are largely interchangeable. In other words, they form the legal and extra legal parts of a nationalist agenda, which seeks to transform not just the politics of Ukraine, but all of Ukrainian society to meet a more nationalistic standard uh, as it sees, as, as they would define it, which is the appropriate, which would be the most appropriate one for uh, Ukrainian society. Uh, one of the key core elements, I would say, of uh, the far right is its anti-liberalism uh, and the desire to replace the, uh, the temptations which they see of both socialism on the left and uh, traditional classical liberalism, uh, maybe uh, in the center, individualism, with uh, a sense of national purpose and mission, uh, which would unite all of the Ukrainian people uh, and, uh, and, and distinguish them from all of their neighbors, both in Europe and in Russia. Uh, to, to make it very simple and clear, Ukraine for Ukrainians. Uh, uh, you, yeah, Ukraine for, for Ukrainians. That's their ideal. And uh, you talk in the book about Ukrainians who I'd never heard of. For example, and correct me if I'm mispronouncing his name, Sergei Savoko. Yeah who was an old friend of Zelensky and actually a former comedy partner of him, of his back when Zelensky was one of the producers, one of the producers of, uh, of Zelensky's television show. Yeah. And so Zelensky comes to power. He's elected on a platform of peace. More than 70% of the vote goes to him. There's a lot of hope that the war in the Donbass that began in 2014 after the U S back coup will end and that Zelensky will preside over making peace. And so as a part of Zelensky's efforts to make peace, he appoints his friend, Sergei Savoko, who's from the Donbass, uh, who unveils a uh, platform for dialogue and reconciliation. Talk about what Savoko tried to do and what happened to him uh, when he tried to 
pursue this peace agenda? Well, uh, at first things looked very promising because he was talking about establishing a nationwide platform, as he called it, for reconciliation and unity. Um, and uh, he was working from the grassroots rather than the top. The problems that he ran into were when he started to say, because he himself is from the, the Eastern regions, from the Donbass, he started to say, well, both sides need to re-examine their assumptions. Eastern and Western Ukrainians need to re-examine their assumptions about each other and learn to communicate with each other. And in this process, he pointed out that the dominant discourse in the past has been of, uh, at least since 20, 2004, if not, if not earlier, uh, or, and, and especially since 2014, the dominant discourse has been of Western Ukrainians uh, trying to change the people of Donbas, to Ukrainianize them. And they don't necessarily feel that they need to be doing anything more, that they're perfectly good Ukrainians as they are. And so Sivoko argued that both sides needed to step back from their ideological assumptions and figure out a way to, uh, to understand what it was that they had in common and to share and to build on that. And this greatly offended the um, nationalist uh, elements, which, uh, as you pointed out, once uh, the move was made to announce a, a national movement for this sort of reconciliation and unity, attacked Sivoha. Uh, personally, and uh, threatened his life. And as a result, um, he had to um, basically withdraw from, from public view. Now, he was still very courageous and public until uh, early, uh, early this year, after the, uh, until before the Russian invasion. Um, but after that, uh, he basically had no more ability to speak in public and has since disappeared from view. Um, I see Sivoka's national platform as very much in the same vein as other uh, very uh, inspiring, to my mind, examples of unity and reconciliation after the trauma of warfare, uh, which I refer to as uh, I point out it, are the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. People don't often know that uh, these have been in existence in for over 50 years and have worked been at, at work in over 40 different countries. And so there's a rich history of um, these sorts of organizations getting hostile groups together and working out a shared platform upon which to build uh, a new society together. And it's voices like his, uh, Ukrainian voices like his, that we just don't hear about uh, in, in the West. And we also don't hear about often the Minsk Accords, which was the peace agreement reached in 2015 to end that war. Uh, you write a lot about Minsk in your book. And uh, you, I think, I think it's fair to say, put the majority of the blame for the failure to implement Minsk on the far right of Ukraine and, and their successful intimidation of the Ukrainian government. Um, I'm wondering if you saw the recent comments, though, from Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, who seemed to admit that Minsk was never actually uh, intended to make peace. It was just intended, in her words, to, quote, give Ukraine time uh, and use this time to get stronger. That's what... Merkel said, and her comments were interpreted by uh, many critics as being an admission that the states that brokered Minsk, uh, Germany, France, were never serious about using it to make peace to end the war in the Donbass, but basically stalling for time to help Ukraine build up uh, its weaponry uh, and its armed forces to fight this war today. And Poroshenko, who signed Minsk, has previously made similar comments. I'm wondering what you thought about Merkel's comments. Another interpretation is that she was simply trying to placate the uh, 
uh, hawkish crowd inside NATO states who are criticizing her for daring to try to make peace back then with Ukrainian rebels. But uh, how did you take her comments? And um, mm. how do you see now the failure of Minsk and the inability for it to be, for it to be implemented and avoid this war? So I think the history of Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko is clearer on this than it is with uh, Merkel and her French uh, counterparts. Um, so for Poroshenko, this was never a serious negotiating framework because, as I point out, if you read the text of the document, it essentially allows for regionalism in Ukraine. The exact nature of the region, uh, regionalism that was to be granted to the eastern portions of uh, Donbass um, was to be negotiated uh, in the Minsk process. But um, it the, the very concept of regionalization uh, was, uh, let's say, put it this way, is anathema to uh, nationalists, uh, nationalist discourse in Ukraine. So that was a non-starter for them. And uh, Poroshenko realized this, I think, very quickly and uh, consequently shifted to uh, the rejection of everything in Minsk. <clears throat> Meanwhile, <clears throat> um, building up the armed forces as quickly as possible. For Merkel, I think that she and her French counterparts and the United States uh, really pursued up until the very uh, end, until, until early 2022, a dual track policy. In other words, if Ukraine would have been willing to reach a negotiated settlement, they probably would have gone along with that at the time. And that's how I interpret all of the addenda that were made to the Minsk Accords, the different formulas by Steinmeier and others, and I go through those in, in considerable detail. Those were, <clears throat> I have to suspect, because people's names, senior diplomats and presidents, names were attached to them. I think they were more good faith efforts to bring <clears throat> the hostilities to an end, at least to accomplish a ceasefire from which then further negotiations could be, <clears throat> could be pursued. But there was always a simultaneous track in the West, and I associate this most clearly with the efforts of the United States and Ambassador Kurt Volker, who basically dismissed the Minsk Accords like Poroshenko as a non-starter and supported um, a, a total Ukrainian victory over Russia, namely a reconquest, if necessary by military means, of uh, the far uh, of of the of Donbas and Crimea, and here I think we see an interesting dichotomy emerge <clears throat> in the Minsk process, which we are also seeing emerge right now. That is to say, between those who say uh, in the West, victory means the reconquest of all of Ukrainian territory, including Crimea. And those who say, come on, let's be realistic. Crimea uh, is not going to be reconquered by Ukraine, uh, nor do they especially want to be in Ukraine. However, uh, we could use that as a bargaining chip to get Russia to relinquish uh, most or even perhaps all of uh, the rest of Ukrainian territory, conceding essentially uh, Crimea because of its peculiar history. Uh, well, because of its peculiar history uh, with Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia. So I think that dichotomy existed then and it uh, continues to exist now. <clears throat>
You mentioned Kurt Volker, the former U.S. envoy to Ukraine. In your book, you have a great quote from him, or I think a very um, apt quote from him, that really summarizes the uh, prevailing U.S. attitude toward Russia, especially in Ukraine, where Volker is writing uh, around the uh, June 2021 summit between Biden and Putin, their only face-to-face meeting of uh, Biden's presidency. Mm. And Volker writes this. He says, quote, any outcome that seems reassuring and benign on the surface actually works in Putin's favor. And Volker goes on to declare that, quote, the best possible outcome is one of a lack of agreements altogether. In short, as Volker puts it, quote, success is confrontation. So according to the former U.S. envoy to Ukraine, who also, by the way, uh, worked for a group that did lobbying uh, for Raytheon, the weapons manufacturer that's profited handsomely off of the uh, Ukraine war, uh, success is confrontation. And uh, I think that's a great way to describe the guiding credo for U.S. policy toward Russia, especially when it comes to the Ukraine war. A, a truly Orwellian statement, if there ever was one, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not not much to add to that. Hus- no. War is peace. Hostility is, is you know, friendship. <laughs> so let me ask you more about Minsk. So the Ukrainian government complaint is that Minsk was agreed to under uh, under very difficult conditions for Ukraine. They were outgunned by Russian-backed rebels in the east, and so this deal for them was bad, but they had no other choice. Uh, and so Minsk needed to be re- uh, renegotiated. Did the Ukrainian government, in your opinion, make a serious effort to renegotiate Minsk and try to come to a more amenable solution for their interests? <sighs> So I talk in detail about the law that was passed, uh, and I forget what year it was exactly now, Uh, but there was a very significant law the first time that the um, Minsk Accords came up for renewal, for extension, because all the deadlines uh, to fulfill them in 2014 had expired. And in the process of of trying to um, gain enough support in the Ukrainian parliament for an extension of the Minsk Accords as written, um, a law had to be passed uh, which indicated the parameters of the reintegration of of the Donbass into Ukraine. And they basically denied the fundamental premise in that law of the Minsk Accords, the Minsk II Accords, which was uh, regional autonomy in exchange for subordination to Ukrainian sovereignty. So there had to be certain local rights guaranteed in the constitution, that, that those were essentially the terms of the Minsk Accords, before the local rebels would lay down their arms and allow for uh, the Ukrainian forces to regain control of the eastern border. And by uh, demanding uh, that the border control be, uh, be transferred before any guarantees of local rights, the uh, Ukrainian government in that law upended the Minsk Accords process. And after that, there really was no compromise possible within the framework of the Minsk Accords because they had been effectively made illegal under Ukrainian law. This was never pointed out sufficiently uh, by the Western interlocutors who seemed uh, after, and I'm not sure if it's 2017 or 2018, I think it was 2017, when the law was passed, uh, after that, essentially, the negotiations became pointless because the two sides had fundamentally contradictory interpretations of how the process uh, leading to the end of the conflict should proceed. And this is Law 7163. No doubt. I... Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. And, and as you point out in the book, it doesn't even mention the Minsk Accords. Yes. Right. Which is which is pretty striking because you have this agreement to end the war and then you're passing 
a whole new law uh, about the, law, this the status was the first, of those territories. Yeah. This is the first in, in a series of laws, which uh, over time have become harsher and harsher with respect to the inhabitants of Eastern Ukraine yeah. and uh, Crimea, uh, the, pointing out that, that they needed to go through processes of re-education and filtration before they could be recognized in uh, uh, once the territories were reintegrated into Ukraine, before they could be allowed full citizenship rights in Ukraine. So this was the first in a series of laws that um, were labeled as uh, laws devoted to the reintegration of these temporarily uh, separated territories. How do you respond to claims uh, made by supporters of the uh, Ukrainian government that, uh, and, and many pundits here in the U.S., that the uh, rebellion in the East, the Eastern Donbass, they're essentially all just Russian proxies, that they're a creation of Russia, that they don't really reflect local attitudes, uh, local convictions, but they're basically just puppets of Russia. And that's been the problem since 2014. Such an interpretation is based on an ignorance of the local history, because as I point out, and I'm certainly not the only one to write about this, there are actually a handful <clears throat> of Western uh, historians specializing in the history of the Donbass, and, and I, I mentioned their, their work in mine, I rely on their work. Um, these regions have always had a distinctive identity within the context of Ukraine. It's not fair to say that they wanted to be part of Russia. What they wanted was to be recognized for their own regional autonomy, distinct from certainly the type of Ukrainian identity that dominated in Western Ukraine. That was not their identity. They had their own distinctive Eastern Ukrainian identity, but neither did they fully see themselves as part of a greater Russia. They wanted to retain that local autonomy. And part of their personal tragedy is that there was no room for them in modern uh, post-Soviet Ukraine. Um, and uh, their fate within Russia is also unclear because um, there's not um, well, uh, there's not a lot of regionalism in the context of modern Russia either, at least not for regions that are so close ethnically to the standard of great Russian identity. So it's, it's really been tremendously difficult and sad for them. I call them, this group, the other Ukrainians that we don't talk about much. And I devote quite a bit of time in my book to their history, um, not so much their cultural identity, which is distinct from the Ukrainian standard, but also in particular, their political uh, descent from and, and striving for autonomy from the administration in Kiev. And this has been going on since 1992. And so you mentioned that uh, these Eastern Ukrainians didn't necessarily want to be a part of Russia. They just wanted their own culture yeah, uh, yeah. respected. Is it fair to say also that Russia didn't necessarily want to absorb them? I think that's fair because they were clearly an apple of discord. Of course, once the fighting began, the leadership, uh, the political leadership of those regions, such as it is, I have no way of speaking to how popular they are. And I am dubious of any uh, polling done during wartime uh, by any party. Uh, but whatever, but the leadership that there is at the time uh, and the ones that um, are recognized as, as, as the leaders uh, in that uh, territory, um, they naturally, for the own survival of their region, seeing that they were fighting against 
uh, what they saw as a coup in Kiev in 2014 had to uh, indeed align more and more with Russia. Uh, and now to the point that uh, they uh, have essentially uh, been absorbed into Russia uh, de facto uh, and de well, just de facto. And as a result, um, but I would point out that this is a process that has taken them eight years to go through. Uh, it, it, is, it is some, it's been a long divorce between Donbass and Ukraine. And uh, it's been so painful and so devastating for them that I have difficulty imagining how they can ever be reintegrated into a Ukraine except as subjects uh, rather than full, full citizens. Where do you see the prospects of the Ukrainian state? Do you think the state as we know it will ever exist again? Well, it exists today. And I think that there will be a Ukraine in certainly the foreseeable future. Um, I have no way of knowing what Russian intentions are, what the Russian government's intentions are with respect to Ukraine. If I were to guess based on what has happened <laughs> historically between 1991 and 20, early 2022, I would say that uh, Russia recognizes the legitimacy of an independent Ukraine, but wanted that Ukraine to have a different political complexion domestically and to be neutral. Uh, so the two objectives that Putin has talked about for a very, very long time has been political and cultural pluralism in Ukraine, effectively allowing people of Russian heritage, although of Ukrainian nationality, to speak their own language, have their own religion, and essentially um, be the political uh, leaders in the regions, in their own regions. Uh, basically uh, a form of cultural and political autonomy. And uh, for the foreign policy orientation of Ukraine, they would have uh, preferred what was written into the Ukrainian constitution until it was changed uh, recently, which is uh, neutrality. And when those two principles were effectively discarded by the Ukrainian political leadership, uh, tensions escalated rapidly. Nikolai Petro, professor of political science at the University of Rhode Island, author of the new book, The Tragedy of Ukraine, What Classical Greek Tragedy Can Teach Us About Conflict Resolution. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.